right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kuder. And today we have with us Yusuf Butros, one of my really good friends. We've been friends for a little over 20 some years. We used to grind together. Speaking of grinding, what's the name of the company again, Yusuf? It's called uh, Grind Consulting. So there's a reason why it's called Grind, and it's Grind with G R N D. So, Yusuf, how did it all start? I've been in retail all of my life. And in many of the retail roles that I've had, I have always been in charge of training, creations, you know, configuring systems in the back end. I've always been the number two guy, the enabler, the guy who mm -hmm. figures out the how of any business. And I really love the startup. I got into consulting because in a previous life of mine, I was an employee at a company called Mobile Clinic, which some of your listeners may be familiar with. And the company did professional smartphone repair. And at the time, yeah. I there was not really any way to fix your phone. You, you could either send it to Rogers, and you're familiar with that process. We both worked in the wireless waves if and the T-boots back. of the world. Yeah, it takes two weeks. There goes your baby pictures, all of your contacts. Phone is completely yeah. wiped. And the remember, we used to like hold our breath when someone brings the phone, right? We're like, ah, oh, just sign a waiver. Here's a waiver. Yeah, it's gonna be we wiped. Don't know. And people were never happy about it, right? And sometimes you got a loaner, sometimes you didn't. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was never as good as the phone that you had. It's always something subpar to make sure that the customer was going to bring the phone back. And the only other option was to take it to kiosk in the mall. The guy would do it right then and there, but I don't know if he's going to be there next year. Yeah. So there was a really big need for professional smartphone repair and same day smartphone. Repair. Mm -hmm. Long story short, we opened in 2015. I was their first employee. I hired a couple technicians. We learned everything that we could about the business from a sister company in France. We opened in September and in the six years that I was there, helped them open 91 locations across the country. And in June of 2020, uh, which was about five years into what I was doing, Hellas bought the company for 165 million. Wow. And I was really, really happy about that because I never thought that it would get to that level. But as you know, COVID did not really provide the same experience to other small businesses. People were constantly trying to adjust from the crazy restrictions, the rules that kept changing. Some businesses actually had to shut down completely because they could not handle that strain. And I mean, running a business is difficult in, right? And here I am, I'm working from home. I have a secure job. The company that I was, I first started, you know, I was like number one employee. So I did all of their systems, their training. That's what I was in charge of at the end of the six years. Here I am, all my debts paid, my got shares. I had all of these things and I was really successful. And the people that I actually cared about were struggling with their own businesses. And it's called grind because that's how people describe work. Grinding every day. I'm, you know, always on the grind, that kind of thing. And I found such an interesting way to describe work because when you grind two things together, one of those things wears down. That's sometimes what work feels like. Mm -hmm. It wears you down and you're moving forward despite the friction that you feel in your business. Yeah. So... That's, you're, you're shaping it up as well, too, in, in a way, right? Like you're absolutely. grinding it, you're shaping it up. One side of it could potentially go away and the other side is a little bit more shaped up the way you want. Maybe not. Possibly. But when you are trying to grow your own business, you are working crazy amounts of hours. You are inching forward very little steps at a time. Yeah. And sometimes you experience burnout a lot of during COVID. Sorry. I just felt like COVID brought something into the spotlight that I always instinctively, which is people don't really care about only competitive pay. They want meaningful work. Yeah. They want a good company culture. They want flexibility. They want opportunity for advancement. There's so many other things about work that makes it worth it rather than money. And there's a lot of rich people who are miserable, I'm sure. 100%. But, and I feel like COVID actually just did this to a lot of businesses, a lot of people, a lot of relationships as well, too. Yeah. Because it allowed you that time to reflect. You had so much time with yourself to reflect on what's going on and, and find the important. Absolutely. And one of the things that I like to do with clients is to get back to the roots or the core purpose of the company or the founder and really bring out in them their why statement. And this is something that is coined by Simon Sinek, who you probably know. But I think that is a core aspect of why people will join a company in the first place. Because usually speaking, when somebody joins the company, they're really excited on day one. And it may not end up being that way in yeah. their second year, their third year. That passion that they initially had when they joined gets diluted. And it's because expectations that they had may not be met or they're doing something that may not be relevant or the company is not really what it seemed when they first 
joined. Yeah. So when you're interviewing an employee, guess what? They're interviewing t- they're interviewing you yeah. as well. Oh yeah. They're asking themselves, do I really want to work here? And COVID really brought that into the spotlight. I think it's always it always was there, but it really magnified the problem. Mm-hmm. So you have to have as a company nowadays, you have to have a great work environment. You have to give people something higher than themselves to shoot for. And then you can talk about training and then you can talk about performance yeah. and then you can talk about scaling your business. But finding the right people is key, but just like dating, you got to be the right person too, right? You can't just find the one. You got to be the one mm-hmm. in a way, right? But find like essentially what you're saying is find what you want in you first before you go out and yeah. start kind of. You have to be aligned with your core purpose, with your vision. You have to run your business according to your values. Eventually, if you are able to make that shine through your company culture, it then shines through your customer experience. Mm -hmm. Every one of us has been in a situation where they've either gone to a retail store, person who is helping them, you could tell that they're just waiting to clock out. Yeah, they they're just there for a paycheck. And on the other end of the spectrum, somebody who loves their job so much that they get you excited about something that you wouldn't normally be excited about. And you end up buying more. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Isn't that so strange? It's because you can tell that person's passionate, but... That's the pesky guy at the Apple store, man. Every time. (laughs) But they design that into their hiring process. Exactly. They find people who already believe what they believe, and they just teach them the skill. But you hire for character. You teach skill. Customers end up buying more, sometimes up to 30% more, especially if you train them. And that is the missing opportunity that most, at least in my experience, most small business owners don't know that because they don't know what they're missing. Yeah. But when you find somebody who is already passionate about what industry, your company, whatever, you're able to make that person shine, you can support them, train them. You have a more profitable business, mm-hmm. first of all. That's what everybody wants. But you have less turnover, less cost on training. Training is a very big burden in terms of time and effort. And you can now scale your business. You can actually eventually, hopefully, turn that person into a people manager and get them to lead others, right? So COVID brought a lot of things into the spotlight. And it made me question what I was doing. For somebody else. I loved my time at Mobile Clinic. I don't think I would be the person that I am without that experience. But I was like, you know, well, why can't I do this for other business owners? There are so many great businesses out there, Mm -hmm. people who really care. There's that charm that you get in a small business that you don't get maybe at a a larger enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said about like a, a boutique shop. Yeah. In one way. And that's actually like even in 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 our sort of industry in real estate, we're when we look at some like some realtors and they say like I work at a boutique shop, you feel that sort of sense of like you know they're on the ball. They're yeah. literally just kind of touching you in every way. They really care. They really care about what they do. They really care about their customers. So I asked myself, well, if I could do this for a company primarily focuses on service and teaching a skill that is quite difficult to learn. Phone repair is not like something simple. It's, it's delicate work. I'm sure I can teach anything. I'm sure I can learn any. And now I work with small businesses. I learn about their business. I get the expertise from the founder, but I give them that added edge of being able to codify what they already do well, allow their people to do it at the same level. Mm -hmm. No one's really going to care as much as the owner, but that doesn't mean that you can't provide the same customer experience. Yeah, And that's how you build a brand with the same consistent experience over and over and over and over again. You start to build predictability in your business. You start to build trust. And that's how a brand grows its reputation amongst its customers. That's why when you go to Starbucks, when you go to McDonald's, you don't even read the reviews anymore. You know exactly what to expect because they've built that into customers' minds, right? That's how you really nail down branding. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not just the logo or the design of the brick and mortar business or anything like that it is with continued consistent experience that turns into predictability that turns into trust. Yeah. They don't make the best burgers, but I know exactly what to expect exactly. when I go in there and they have their piece. customers. Yeah. Exactly. The predictability piece, I think it's one of the biggest things that it's going for those big box companies because they built their name and repetition on the fact that it's always going to be the same. Like I know when I walk into McDonald's that my, Americano is going to taste this. When I walk in, for example, like Walmart, I know they like where the shelves are. 
yeah, what, what, what things to expect on that shelf because it's always consistent. That's by design. Yeah. That's not a mistake. They, they spend millions and upon millions of dollars building that into the psychology <clears throat> of the customer. And so when you see their logo, that's when you get the brand feelings. Then with this, we get those thoughts and feelings about the brand. Mm -hmm. That's what brand is. It's what customers think about you. Yeah. How they feel about you, not what you think of yourself. So how did it start? So after the sale, I stayed there for a year. I started dealing with a lot different people and I was going through my own, you know, internal dialogue. And I decided that I wanted to do what I did for mobile clinic for other businesses and help solve problems at an industry scale. That's what mobile clinic did. We changed an entire industry and we made a service that wasn't readily available to almost all Canadians. There's I mean, they're alive and well now. They are over 150 locations. But I decided to talk to my own network and speak to business owners that I knew and see how I could help them. Didn't come up with a logo, didn't come up with a website for like two years. Didn't do any of that. I just decided to go figure out what people were really struggling with and see how I can help them. Yeah. Looking for a problem to solve, essentially, is how it started. Eventually came up with the branding and the website and all that kind of stuff later. And now, probably wouldn't see it now, but I'm in the second iteration of the website. So we're building it in the background. I'm going to relaunch it. I have a very systematized of packages that people can choose from based on their goals and what their milestones are. Either they're opening their first location they want to hire their replacement or they want to expand their store network. So depending on where they are in that journey, I would be able to give them a set of, you know, services of building their SOPs, configuring their systems, training their people, coaching their people, whatever it is, uh, project managing store openings, some, all stuff that I used to do in my past life. I just um, want to mention something and I don't mean to cut you off, but, yeah. you know, for folks that are watching SOPs, standard operating, yeah. the reason why, why is that important? Why is that important to build into any business? Because how you do something isn't necessarily how the next person will do it. So you have to be very, very specific about what your customer journey should look like, yeah. what questions you should ask, how you should treat your customer, your style of the operation. Everything is built into your SOPs. And here's the best analogy that I can come up with that may be relatable to everybody. Mm -hmm. You're trying to drive across Canada. Yeah. And as an entrepreneur, you may be the driver or you may have your people driving that vehicle. And you have three things to consider on this journey. The directions, the vehicle that you're driving, and the person behind the wheel, right? The SOPs are directions. How do you get from here to here? When do you turn? Which intersection? Where do you stop? Where do you get gas? All of these things. Your systems is the vehicle that you drive. You can do it on a one-speed bicycle. It's going to take a lot of time and effort right? That's what most businesses do. They get to work right away. And that's, that's what they do. And then there is the people piece. The SOPs is the direction. It's really, really important so that you can get there as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, and for customers so that you're easy to do business with. And that's how you create consistency. Yeah. If you have something that you're doing the same way every single time, that's how you build predictability. You can't do it without an SOP. It's really more like the, that piece of, we like to call it rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Yeah. And in any business, if you really want to look at predictability, the best way to build it is building standard operating procedures that allow you to rinse and repeat so many times. Absolutely. It's a recipe, right? Yeah. The order of the steps in the recipe is just as important as the quality of your ingredients. Especially when it comes to baking. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if I were to tell somebody, make a hot dog. Everybody knows their own way of making a hot dog, right? But if I were to tell that to five separate people, I will get five separate results unless I'm a very, very specific as to how I like my hot dog. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It is the easiest thing you can make, but there's still so much variation. Yeah. And if it, there's so much variation, it's something as simple as that. Imagine a customer experience. Ever been to Chicago hot dogs? Yeah. Each different store has its own recipe. Each different store has its own recipe in Chicago. And they all do great hot dogs. Yeah. But each one tastes different. The cool thing about it, though, is you can go tomorrow and it'll taste the same for that same store. Yes. Because they have standard operating procedures. The owner sits, stands there and goes, this is how it's done. And that's how you're going to do it. Everything. SOPs define what success looks like, you know. So the end result is uh, profit. That's what people care about. But... Beyond that, 
in my world, when you have one location, two location, 20, 50, 90 locations, you need to make sure that everybody's doing the same thing, regardless of who is helping them yeah. and where they are. And that's kind of where it gets a little bit tricky because, you know, it's not so easy to write SOPs. If I were to, there, one really great example that I can give you is in grade five. I remember the story. We had just learned about the human anatomy and the muscles and the bones and all that kind of stuff. Really cool stuff. And then to test our knowledge, our teacher asked us to write how to kick a soccer ball, but in the context of which muscles to flex when. And everybody had a very, very different way. And he so funny, he took two or three of those papers when we submitted the assignment and actually demonstrated what people were writing. Mm -hmm. And the answers were wildly different. Yeah, Everybody knows instinctively how to do it. But when you really get down into the details and you break it down, SOPs are so important because they define the exact customer experience that you're trying to, which eventually will create the profit that you want, yeah. right? Sorry, we went on a tangent with that, but it's yeah. very, very important to what you do, which is basically helping clients, if I understand this correctly, replicate themselves as an owner and build a successful brand by allowing, for example, to scale and open up multiple locations. Yeah. So why would you know, any sort of organization, why would they look into hiring Grind? working with track record. So that would say the bit, that's the biggest thing uh, for me. Expanded a company and we provided a service that never really existed. So it was a very new kind of, there was no roadmap to follow, right? We took concepts from different businesses and we made it work at scale. And with a $165 million exit, I'd like to say that I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's 165 million. It's not a Small feet to fail for sure, but it's definitely not, yeah. it showcases in a way that look, look, it's it's doable for any business to do something like if they're willing to put the time and effort. Yes, and I I'm very obsessed about customer experience. I really really care about the people who work on the front lines because I used to be the that person, mm -hmm. the wireless, the T booths of the world. I remember what it's like to be a salesperson. I remember what it's like to have great training. I don't know if you remember this guy but he always sticks out in my mind. Do you remember Brock Simmons? Of course, I have him on speed. Brock is one of the first people that really made an impact in my life because his training was so impactful. When we went to the, what is it, the travel lodge on Carling? Oh. <laughs> we used to go- It's no longer there, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, what a throwback. You're dating yourself. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I remember leaving those training sessions feeling like I had superpowers and I was mm. like, I want to be able to harness that and empower other people to do their job better yeah, and to love their job. Nobody wants to go into work to suck, right? No, no. They And the best part about it is it was very sort of laid back, right? Like I, you did not have to sleazy sales guy. You did no. not have to be anything. No. All you had to do is just apply some listening skills yeah, and asking the right questions. That's right. Uh, you want to put your customers in a position to buy not to be sold. Nobody wants to be sold. People want to be, people want to buy, right? It's how you uncover those needs and how you meet those needs. That's where the skill is. And when it comes to operations or providing any service, that's something that I think people can codify. Although most small business owners may think that no one will do it as good as them. It's not true because it's been done before. McDonald's and started. That's the thing too. Like if yeah. you're thinking that way, it's the wrong way to think in my opinion, because like, how are you going to be able to replace yourself if you're always depending on the fact that you have to be there to do it? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a really ironic thing that the business that you started to give you the freedom that you want ends up being the shackles that keep you down. Well put. Very well put. I find that quite often because I, as I do, I interview businesses, business owners like yourselves across the city. And it's always the case. It's like figuring out how to get out of that rut that I'm in. Like <clears throat> it's a great business, don't get me wrong, but I'm always sort of tied to it. The freedom is not there. I created it so I can have the freedom, but now I need a way out. Yeah. And that's a function of where do you spend your time? Mm -hmm. In a retail location, a small business owner may spend lots of, like it takes a long time to train somebody really well. But if you were confident that they 
that your people treated your customer the way that you would treat them, why do you need to be there? It's one of my um, old mentors had used to say something, especially about managing. You probably remember Bruce Fowler. Yeah. Actually, he used to say like, when you train somebody, you want to train them that if you're there or if you're not, they're producing actually better than if you're not there. They're producing better when you're not there. And that's how you know that you're a good manager <coughs> or yeah. a good business owner. Yeah. Because you're basically setting it up in a way that you can have that freedom that you want without yes. necessarily always looking over your shoulders, trying to figure out if they're doing it properly, if they're not doing it properly, what's going on there. Yeah. And those standard op operating procedures is really where it comes handy to set that up properly. And that's just the first step, yeah. right? Going to the sports world, I mean, the best, uh, the, the best athletes don't always make the best coaches. No. And just because you know something really well, doesn't mean that you know how to teach it really well. Because it, what you know or what you say, it doesn't matter. It's how it's received by the other person and how they can replicate what it is that you're doing. So it requires a level of thinking that breaks down any one thing into very digestible steps. SOPs are great. Now with the age of technology and AI, nobody wants to read a boring document. And you want to make sure that people are not only understanding what they're reading or, you know, the kind of training that you're giving them, that they are actually doing the thing that you're teaching them and that it's making a difference in your business on your bottom line. Mm -hmm. There are levels to evaluating the quality of your training. And most people will write an SOP, they'll put it on a Google Drive, and they'll call that their training program. And if you want to build a multi-location business, that just doesn't cut it. You really have to invest a lot of time. In fact, though, it is one of the cheapest ways to keep your people costs down. Because in a service business, what I specialize in, that is the number one thing. You're selling labor cost. at a premium. Yeah, yeah. it's right? definitely the highest cost, the highest cost of business. Yeah, it's beyond your rent, it's people costs. Yeah. So how do you make the most of the labor that you are spending every two weeks? Right? You want to make sure that every opportunity that comes in the door, you're making the most of that, that you're creating repeat business, that you're creating referrals. Yeah. And when shit goes wrong, things happen. It's okay. That your customers trust you enough to fix their problems. Yeah. The best kinds of companies are the ones who can handle things really well when they go wrong. It's not the ones who do the initial service right, but it's how they treat their customers post sale. Mm -hmm. After the service is done, when things go wrong, how do you handle that? And if you've built that trust, customers will give you the opportunity to fix it. And that is the best scenario. Yeah. So Yusuf, thanks again for being on the show. And uh, for folks that are watching, if you like what you see, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can get more and more episodes about this. And every time that we come up with a new episode, you can be alerted about it and, and know more about this fantastic city that we live in. Thanks.